was here when uh, Fred uh, disappeared and uh, has a lot to tell us about that fateful day. Yeah, well, I've been around the airport since I was a kid. I grew up in the back seat of my late father's de Havilland Chipmunk, which was housed in Turbo Aero's hangar over yep. there. Yep. Right where we're standing here is where um, Delta Sierra Juliet departed on that fateful flight with Fred Valentich. Um, okay. Same sort of aircraft same size, different colour. DSJ was blue and white. I'd been a refueler down here and uh, Fred trained, learned to fly just before me. Yeah. Um, no, actually it was the other way around. I, I got qualified before him and then he finished off his about two years later, uh, culminating in his website. Fred was going down and I had time to kick on to pick up three or four passengers. He wouldn't pick up three or four passengers in a four-seater aircraft. He overloaded. Yeah. I understood he went down there to pick up crayfish and also to get additional night experience. So that's rating. interesting because there are the two stories. Yeah. Some people saying that he was going to pick four people up yeah. and he took four life jackets with him. Yeah. Did, did he take four life jackets with him? I don't know that anyone can verify that okay. because we haven't found the wreckage. Yeah. Um, the lead up to um, that, the years leading up to that, I've been intensely uh, interested in researching missing planes and ships down the um, surf coast, um, backing on to Jack Loney's work in shipwrecks. Very intrigued with that. I have friends that had holiday home at Hollow Bay, close to the airstrip, so I had a regular base to fly in and out through the 70s and conduct some of research I wanted to do to get to know the locals and the trawler men and learn some interesting things like the Japanese fishing fleet were in um, using squid lamps late at night um, with the lead up this for vintage. So what, what colour is a squid lamp? Oh, it's just a bright light to attract squid and fish. That is kind it of like a green light? White I believe. White, because Fred did talk yeah. about having this the green thing. Yeah. Green thing, yeah. I'm wondering whether reflected clouds or through the hills, that kind of thing may have um, affected uh, what was happening there. But see, my theory is torpedoed because they haven't found any wreckage. One of the biggest searches and the biggest air mystery in Australia's history, absolutely nothing. There's plastic fantastic in these planes. Uh, if it hit the water, uh, it's all going to come apart and things will float. Big search like that, no oil, no air gas leak, no plastic, no cushions. My theory is torpedoed like everybody else's. What gets up my nose is how Kazer officials can still say, oh, Fred was an idiot, he must have been disorientated and he's bit the farm. Well, they haven't proved that. And so I think that's a real slap in the face to his long suffering uh, family. And did you know uh, Steve Roby? I've heard of Steve, yeah, probably even spoken to him on the radio at the time, um, going in and out of Apollo Bay, he okay. was working those sectors. Um, so he was a regular at the airport? Steve was the air traffic controller at Melbourne Airport, uh, but he was on the sector that night okay. for recovering uh, part of the route that Fred was on, Cape Otway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Steve would be the first to conclude that there's something very mysterious about this loss in, in lieu of the fact that here's a, 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 a talented young man, he's going on to airlines and he was intelligent, articulate, he was trying to give his position reports and he gave quite a commentary about this strange uh, craft that was uh, playing cat and mouse games with him. Uh, if he'd been disorientated and upside down using a handheld mic, he would not have been able to talk to Steve as fluently as that, and there were tapes to prove it. Uh, we'd like to get those, at least one of those tapes back from Dr. Richard Haynes, yep. uh, ex-NASA NARCAP. He's the only one that's got the original tape, It's yeah. in his attic, and uh, 
we've pounded him uh, of late in the last uh, 24 hours to return it as part of Australia's history 33 years later and should be declassified. Yeah. And as for uh, Annex 13, I think it is uh, the Articles of um, International Civil Aviation um, Administration saying that they have a right to keep these things silent for the benefit of the family. <laughs> the family bloody well want to know. Yeah. It's yeah. their son. Yeah. And for all we know, he's died or been abducted or something has happened. And they have a right and the authorities have a, a duty of care to come good on everything they know and, uh, and share it with the, the family first and then everybody else. And if there's an air safety thing, and we believe there is, like it's become hazardous to be to do these sort of flights. I won't go down there at night anymore. I used to. I, yep. I was in and out um, Apollo Bay. I'd go early in the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning in summer, and, and time it so that it was first light to land at Apollo Bay and then come out of there uh, at last light to come home in the dark. I won't go down there now. Rick, what's the what's the biggest hazard down there? An unknown type situation, like Fred. Had. And we're not, like, I'm not living in fear about that, but I am concerned that there's an unknown air safety issue here. Either we've got an ET presence somewhere down there off the coast, or somebody's playing with uh, technology or um, experiments at uh, the black budget. We just, we just don't know for sure. Do you think it's possible? I mean, this is a little bit of a wild theory, but do you think it's possible with Pine Gap? that they may have recorded that particular night? Well, with uh, Pine, Pine Gap NORAD's capabilities, uh, they can detect anything inbound to the planet. Probably more so now than back then. But yep. uh, uh, it wouldn't surprise me of what they were, were tracking and monitoring at the time. Uh, but I, as I say, uh, even these black budget people have a duty of care if there's an air safety issue. Yep. And it's been a similar one in the States where the guy fortunately got his plane back down on the ground, but he tangled with an unknown uh, object that tried to formate on his um, aircraft. It was a craft that he hadn't, was not aware of. And it terrified him. What was the, what was the uh, weather conditions that day? Well, the conditions down at Cape Otway were obviously conducive to conducting a night visual flight to flight to King Island and back, yep. which meant that they had to be pretty good. Good visibility, high cloud, uh, that kind of thing, and yep. the winds wouldn't have been all that significant. So it would have been a reasonably stable sort yeah. of weather. Yeah, and Fred would have been trained to know his limitations. Yep. He's not the sort of guy, as any of these pilots are, to push the envelope. It's yep. not worth it, particularly yep. flying over um, part of the off-ways and then you've got all that motion. When, when you made that final turn towards um, the island, how, how long would that take? 10, 15 minutes, half hour? Um, Cape Otway, I think, to Curry over on King Island was about a 20, 25 minute flight or something. So the overall flight was fairly short? Yeah, it's only about, um, uh, I think, an hour from, from Raven to get down there. Okay. Or something like that. Yeah, I, I was a refueler at Tyson's yeah. in the 70s, and uh, I trained and got licensed just before Fred. Fred completed his after me. Right. I used to fill him up all the time. What sort of guy was he? He's a tall, sort of a lanky guy, nerdy. Yeah. They, some of these kids would wear their um, uh, the flight. Um, the cadet hat, yeah, you know, the yeah. officer's hat, yep. they'd wear it flying. Oh, okay. And I thought it looked cool. <laughs> yeah, not only looked cool, but it was also very useful um, with the headset. Oh, right. Because you didn't get the sore head with yeah. the band. Yeah, because it was underneath. Like, I yeah. actually started doing it flying to have little chipmunks and tiger moths and found that those hats were so for real purpose. Yeah. They made you look like a dad. Yeah. <laughs> or a nerd. <laughs> okay, you see where the DOE is? Yeah. This is roughly the position that Delta Sierra Juliet was always parked in when we refueled him. The Fred trained on a couple of different types of planes. Yeah. And I suspect he trained on low wing and, and then went on to high wing, the 182 for navigation and cruising and that sort of thing.
Relicense test recently because my plane was out of action for yep. a while, getting a new engine and that. Okay. And it was a two-hour exam on the ground, two-hour flight. Yeah. And I said, "Yeah, guys, this is a lot of hard work because they want to assess, the, you know, the whole subject. Yes. It's almost impossible to do it yeah. in just four hours. Yeah. Anyway, we somehow rather got through again. Um, but I was thinking about Fred, and I think that the, the teaching was better. Back in them days, back then, yeah. Yep, back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Um, it's always a mystery as to what happened to Fred. Um, the, the years leading up to 1978, I'd had a very keen interest in exploring and uh, backing onto Jack Bloney's work, missing planes, aircraft, uh, ships down the surf coast, particularly. It's been quite a few. It's been a lot, a lot. And, I was in and out of Apollo Bay a lot. I had friends that had a holiday home closest to the airstrip. Yeah. And that gave me a fantastic base to operate from and talk to local trawler men and, and, and local identities. Yep. Roy Amor lived down there. Uh, Roy was elderly, lived in a um, home next to the holiday home where I stayed. And cut a long story short, Roy was in signals uh, during World War II up at Horn Island and briefly shared a tent with my late grandfather who was an intelligence officer up there at the time. He was a seconded from Central Bureau out of Brisbane. Yeah. And Granddad had been involved in researching Foo Fighters as well as um, water spouts which were responsible for bringing down Allied and enemy aircraft oh, yeah, yeah. in the tropics. Yeah. The Foo Fighters had the real trick. There was not much he could really say about that because the jury was all still out after the war. Whether it was a German or an American weapon or an extraterrestrial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we just don't know for sure. It felt like balls of light, weren't they? Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I matched these two guys from the war years back up again and they were able to get in touch and share a lot of stories. But the lead up to Fred going missing and the months leading up to that, the local trawler men told me that um, the Japanese fishing fleet were allowed to work our territorial waters in the Southern Ocean. Oh yeah, yeah. And that their squid lamps were being aimed all around the clouds and around the hills in the Otways at night time and driving everybody wacky because uh, people were wondering what's going on. Mm -hmm. They were either doing it for Olea or it was part of their operation and, and they didn't realise the reflectiveness of these lamps. Um, one wonders whether they were somehow connected with some of the UFO sightings at the time. Oh, okay. I've actually heard yeah. that before with the trawlers yeah. and the lights. And now, the... If you get in a beam of one of these high-powered lights and you're a light aircraft pilot, it will bring you down. You'll lose really? your night vision, get disorientated. Okay. Okay. But my theory is torpedoed to bits because there's no debris found. And as you can see in these seismos, there's yeah. plastic, fantastic. There's a lot of plastic in the interior and fiberglass, things that would float if it had hit the water with a vengeance. Yeah. Um, and what about, what about the, um, the, 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 what do you call it, the way the tides were running? And yeah, they looked at all that. The yeah. yeah, they've got experts that uh, looked at all that. They had one of the biggest searches. They had two naval frigates. They had uh, long-range Orion trackers. They had uh, light aircraft. And when the search had officially concluded after extended time, yep. it had people like me still looking in my aircraft. Yeah, 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 yeah. We found absolutely no debris. And I, I was even down on the beaches and in desperation one day, after all this, we bush bashed in at Cape Otway and got down to one of the remote beaches. Yep. 
and I'm just digging up the sand looking for anything. <laughs> I found a few old bottles from shipwrecks, but that's about all. Oh, right. Uh, it was one of the most frustrating eras because here was a fellow colleague that um, the academics and the CASA people were saying, oh, he's an idiot, he must have got disorientated, he stuffed up. I don't believe that. Because they said he was flying upside down. How could he be flying upside down and talking sanely on the radio and holding a handheld mic? That's crazy. It wouldn't happen that yeah, way. Yeah, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't, you'd be disorientated. You wouldn't be able to do anything. Yeah. Just so you know, this plane here is a 182. So this plane is very, very similar to what Fred flew. Um, this was the old version. This is a later version. This is a slightly later version than what Fred flew. Different colouring, obviously, because Fred's plane was uh, blue and white um, with the VHDSJ on the back. So, unfortunately, we can't film that one. <laughs> That's long gone. But um, now there were um, there was a tabloid magazine some years ago back in the eighties that had, did publish some photos of what looked like DSJ uh, taken by divers. Oh, in now, the water you mean? Yeah, yep. Even back then it was possible to com do computer imaging and yep. stuff like this graphics. Yep. Uh, it may have been bogus and then the story was, it came from a bogus from Cameron, that uh, the two scallywags wanted 10 grand to show the actual position. Yeah. And uh, this particular film just didn't want to um, pay, pay 10 grand. So we lost the plot. Now we did a search of a lot of those magazines, we just can't find anything. But I do clearly remember seeing it. I had it in my possession, but certainly what, what uh, was a bit frustrating that it looked like a 182 underwater with no damage whatsoever. Now, if you think of it at night time, <laughs> even at stall speed hitting the water, there's going to be a lot of compression for the cosmetic damage. This showed no damage anywhere, so I'm inclined to think it may be a, a bogus beat up that somebody was trying to explore okay. and play games. Yeah, trying to sell their story, so yeah, to speak. Got to yeah. look at the facts. Yeah. 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 But it, that must have been a, a hell of a blow to Weirdo Polentich, the father particularly. Yeah. And he unfortunately fell into some culty type people and said, oh, Fred's working for the Alien Greys and he'll be returned one day. And poor old Gre you know, every anniversary would be sitting on the, the park bench at Cape Otway, gazing out to sea, hoping and praying that he'd pull something come back. What a cruel bite. Yeah, that is very cruel, yeah. isn't it? And they had the, uh, the plaque that was out yeah, there as being stolen. Missing. Um, no one seems to know where that's gone to, and that's very strange because it after this time... It could be a souvenir hunter, but it could be a bit more sinister. But, um, I found that um, the tourism down there, the people are very highly protected. They don't want anything to draw reference to the fact that there are dangers down here that might scare people away from all aspects of enjoying that coastline. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, I found that doing beach patrol. They, um, the local operators did not want to know about dangerous sharks on their surf beaches. So you think maybe it might be one of the locals or a group of locals may be taken yeah. away for that first sure. and, and I tend to agree with you because if you think about it, if, uh, if it was a souvenir hunter, they'd want to be showing it somewhere. Yeah, and it will turn up not. if that's clearly the case, but I don't think we'll ever see it again. Yeah, it's probably been chucked in the water. But it's a shame they didn't, um, you know, just give it to the family. Yeah, we'll be done with it. So we don't want that to That family has been um, subject to a lot of cruel in innuendo. And yeah. A lot of gossip and malicious stuff and some of our colleagues down on the airport have been the worst offenders. Uh, the, the pilot's rumour network uh, file on, on the website, not some of the most disgusting things. Yeah. And I don't go there very much for research data because I can't trust it. And no. Everyone's operating under um, nicknames so you don't know where it's coming from. Well see, with our show we always try to get to the, the grassroots of the story. And the only way you're going to do that is to talk to people like yourself who were around at the time and uh, tell the story for what they know. Right? Yeah. And I'm not interested in any windows or other things like that because no one wants to hear it or know about it. As a, as a pilot, it's always been an air safety issue for me to try and get to the, the core of this thing. I've had my own encounters with anomalous objects. I don't know exactly what they are. 